In this video, we're going to see five composition secrets to make your painting stand out. And you really don't want to miss the last one because I'm pretty sure that you're going to learn a new word today. The first composition secret that I wanted to talk about is actually not a secret. It's I wanted to just bust a myth. The lines don't make good composition. The mistakes that a lot of beginners make with their composition is they try to overlay, you know, some geometric lines. It's very tempting to think of composition as some type of geometry puzzle with, you know, the diagonals, the medians, the thirds, the golden ratio numbers. But this doesn't guarantee a successful painting composition. The first reason is that abstract lines alone may not provide a clear focal point for the viewer. In this example by Bugovo, you have a strong presence of lines, but they don't necessarily follow the geometry of the canvas. They are more free lines. They don't specifically fit in any intersection or any specific focal point that the geometry would dictate. To make a good composition, you need balance and harmony. This means that you don't need to follow a rigid geometry patterns in order to make a good composition. You can just trust your instincts and go with spontaneity. And very often trusting your instincts and going with spontaneity will end up giving you something slightly geometric. But the thing is, the geometry doesn't dictate the good composition, just your instinct, your sense of balance and harmony will prevail and will provide you with a good composition. The main elements in orange don't fit in a specific pattern. They're mostly freely placed and they follow a pattern of shapes, weight distribution, balance and imbalance. This is much more important than lines. The thing is that abstract lines may not inherently convey meaning or narrative to the viewer. They're just an abstract geometrical pattern. For example, what kind of geometry do you need in a painting like that? The geometry itself doesn't have a deeper meaning. And if you try to force your art to follow the geometrical patterns, it might lack the resonance that it might have with the viewer if it was done more freely and spontaneously. Real quick, if you're interested in learning everything there is to know about oil painting, you can check out my course. It's in the description below as always. All right, let's go back to the video. See, the thing with figurative art is that it's all about shapes and geometrical patterns are all about lines. Figurative art is all about making things feel realistic and concrete and geometry is just a mere abstraction. It doesn't exist, we can't see it, and it doesn't have a subliminal power that would make the composition better. Ultimately, art is about dynamism and geometry is static. You can see that what makes the success of a composition is the dynamism of the lines, the energy, the flow. And this is not something that geometry can dictate. And for the last time, it doesn't matter if the forearm crosses the diagonal. It doesn't matter if the eye is right in the intersection of the median line and the third. This doesn't have meaning, but shapes, colors, dynamism, emotion, this has a meaning. So while abstract lines can certainly contribute to creating a, an interesting composition, they must be thoughtfully integrated with the broader context of principles such as focal point, balance and imbalance, and the story in general, the main elements of the story. Relying too much on abstract lines is not what's going to make a successful painting composition. The second idea that I want to cover is that the size is part of the composition. It's a mistake that a lot of beginners make is they completely neglect the size and the dimensions of the canvas they choose and they think that they can make whatever composition on whatever surface of their choice, but it's not true. And it's very important to understand what kind of impact the size and the dimensions have on a composition. And for our first example, we can start with this brand new painting of King Charles. I like Jonathan Yeo's work, but I don't think that this one is his best. 
Well, I'm going to talk about the size a little bit, as you can see. All right, so this was a previous painting of King Charles. I think he was Prince of Wales at the time. And the size of the subject, so Charles, is not bigger than life. But in Jonathan Yeo's work, as you see, the subject is bigger than life. And to me, I don't get it. I don't like this. I don't like giant portraits. And I know it's very trendy in you know, modern contemporary art to make giant faces, but this is really something that I'm, I'm not a fan of. I don't get the point of making giant faces. And this is what I think is a much more successful example. You can get a very big canvas, a very big surface, but still you don't need to make the subject. So the actual face of the model extra big. And you can use all the remaining space to create a sense of space and create an environment in which your subject can live. I often say that the ideal size for a normal portrait is the size of your palm, or if you want to make it extra big, maximum the size of your entire hand. This will make the size of the head slightly smaller than life, and this will actually create a less awkward feeling because it will feel that the subject, the sitter, is behind a window and you're looking through a window. So it creates a little bit of distance. You make the subject slightly smaller. If you have a model pose for you and you take the size of their head and just report the same length on your canvas, it will feel extra big. It will feel that this, the face of the, of the subject is really like in your face, there's no other word. It will feel kind of awkward and it will create this weird sense of gigantism. The size of your artwork relative to the size of your main subject can greatly impact how it's perceived. No matter what, the subject should not occupy most of the space of your canvas. If you look at these Vermeer paintings, for example, they're tiny but there's always breathing space around the models. With this one, the Nymphias by Monet, you have something gigantic, but the idea is to create huge emotional impact by painting giant landscapes that feel almost abstract, to be honest. When you walk into a room like that, it's an almost surreal experience because it's so giant and it's so breathtaking. With small works like that, it's almost like each painting has a, a secret to reveal, but you have to get closer. The third idea, it's a very common one, but it's crucial, is that a canvas is like a window to a different world. With a painting like that, it feels like the viewer is around, looking through a window and seeing the scene happening. Which is why it's so important that there is always a sense of three-dimensionality around your figure. If possible, try to avoid going for a flat background, completely uniform. You can see that it's very simple to create a sense of depth with just two flat colors. This one is flat, this one is just flat as well, but just slightly lighter by creating a little bit of a shadow, you can create a sense of three-dimensionality. So just like a portal to a different world, the canvas is a window that allows us to peer into another world beyond our immediate surrounding. The painted canvas will transport the viewer into the artist's imagination. And you can play with this idea and revert it like Murillo here. In this case, the subject is actually looking at you, looking at it. It might be a scene where something dramatic is happening, but more importantly, the canvas is like a window to the artist's mind. And I'm sorry to come back to this painting again, because I think it's not great, because this is not a window. It feels like you're awkwardly staring at a, a sort of a bunch of flesh, and it feels like this subject is completely stuck to the painted surface. And to be fair, it's the same with this one. What kind of window would give you a, a view like that? There is no sense of three-dimensionality. And these leaves are extremely out of place. They don't work at all. They don't work in terms of color. 
they don't work in terms of light they have not the same light as the model they don't have a shadow they are just a disturbing element that ruins the sense of three-dimensionality that would make the interactive experience successful so try to avoid backgrounds like that if possible because this is really bad fourth kind of composition secret is foreshortening foreshortening is a powerful technique used to create the illusion of depth and perspective by depicting objects and figures as if they were receding into space when utilized effectively, foreshortening can bring a sense of dynamism and energy to compositions in several ways. Just so you know, an example of foreshortening would be this, 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 uh, this foot right here. Simply speaking, foreshortening is when some parts of the body or some parts of the subject seem to appear bigger to the perspective, moving towards the point of view of the viewer. And it can deeply enhance the depth perception, making the paintings more dramatic. You can exaggerate the perspective in the foreground. Foreshortening really offers artists the opportunity to experiment with different perspectives and viewpoints. And it has a lot of expressive potential. By playing with foreshortening techniques, you can convey a sense of drama, tension, or movement this painting by Caravaggio is one of the most sublime examples of using foreshortening in different places. It just makes the painting much more interactive. Foreshortening is an attempt at grabbing the viewer's attention and pulling it inside towards the space of the painting. So it's a very interactive experience. It's great for composition. So very important, if you want to improve your compositions, study perspective. I can't stress this enough. Study with a mannequin like that. Of course, you also want to study foreshortening with the greatest examples from the Baroque master. The Baroque era was a, a moment in time when foreshortening was widely used and was used very spectacularly. So you can study all these masters, the Caravaggio, the Tiepolo. Another great resource is Andrew Loomis's method because there is a big part that talks about foreshortening and there is a lot of examples of how to draw the figure in perspective. And the final composition trick that I'm gonna teach you today has to do with what's called a festaiolo. And I'm pretty sure that you might learn a new term today. I don't know, it's not very commonly used. This figure here is a festaiolo. It's a figure that looks directly at the viewer and it's something that can bring a lot of compositional benefits when painting a composition with multiple characters. It literally means party goer or party host and it comes from the Italian Renaissance. In theaters, the festaiolo was a role of contact with the audience who, among other things, explained the scenes to the spectators. In the school of Athens, for example, Raphael gave himself the role of the festaiolo right here. And this was pretty common in the Renaissance because when a figure looks directly at the viewer like that, it establishes a direct and immediate connection between the artwork and the viewer. And this kind of eye contact can draw the viewer into the scene, creating a sense of intimacy and engagement. Personally, I really like to use this trick. I've used it countless times in my own paintings, but I don't necessarily call it festaiolo. I prefer to call it witness. I don't know, maybe it just makes more sense to me. It's a character that's here to witness the story and witness the fact that the viewer has been part of the story. And I've used this composition trick uh, many times and I can assure you that it's often what the public likes the most because it really it adds an emotional depth this kind of eye contact convey a, a whole range of emotions and they really capture the attention a figure directly looking at the viewer evokes a lot of you know connection curiosity it's intriguing it can even be confrontational it can really add a layer of emotional depth 
that can really push a composition to the next level. So there you go, you've learned a new word today and you have five secrets to make your composition stand out. If you want to see more about composition, just click here and I'll see you for the next one. Bye.